Thank you very much. Um, this paper is based on the collective ideas of archivists, librarians, museum curators and um, ref research information specialists. That's why on your programmes there's four names. Um, two of my colleagues couldn't be here today. Um, it's very much in the spirit of collaboration, um, it, as the theme of the, the conference is, and we're trying to collaborate more even within our own institution. It was conceived from our awareness of the increasingly complex information infrastructure that's supporting the REF and our wish to create a more joined up approach to what we're doing. Um, I'll just move on to the next one. Um, while REF in its current form may not stay with us for all that long, the function of supporting research is something that libraries and museums have been doing at Glasgow for centuries. Librarians since the 15th century, museum curators since the 19th century, archivists and research information managers only 20th century. So, and, um, so doing it not quite so long. Um, and there are increasingly more professionals joining the university services to support the REF, marketing, web designers, public engagement specialists, social media officers, all consuming the information that we as librarians, archivists and curators um, are putting out. Um, and we've, we're needing to find ways to, to communicate with them through their own channels, so social media is one of those. I would say that we don't necessarily have all the answers to the questions that we're going to raise in this paper, but we thought this would be a good forum to begin to, to discuss them. So to give you some of the statistics on Glasgow, founded 1451 and we were 12th overall in the REF 2014. I'll not read all that out, you can, you can see that for yourself. Um, we, in line with other re Russell Group research intensive universities, we've been investing in REF's related support. And as um, professionals in memory institutions, we need to, to find ways to, to interact with them. Um, and to, to try and persuade them that there is more to the, the, the history of the university than just the five year, five or six year ref cycle. Um, our values at, at Glasgow, as per the strategy, everybody's got them, um, passionate, professional and progressive. It's particularly the progressive one that we've been using to try to, to communicate with um, the, the, the wider teams to show that you can learn lessons from the past as we move forward. Um, as RLUK has identified, um, there's a particular challenge in providing online systems to cover access to centuries of research. Um, that's indeed what most RLUK members are working towards. The biggest challenge for us at Glasgow, we feel, is not delivering the online content, it's delivering it in an integrated, efficient, relevant, engaging way. And we'll give a few illustrations of what we're doing from our library archive and museum perspectives. Um, for those of you based in universities, these sorts of um, tools will be very familiar to you. Publications repositories have been developed by um, all universities to put out their, their research data. The latest one to be developed um, for us is the Impact Repository. All of these are delivering truly excellent services to support the REF, but research started a long time before the REF, and our combined institutional college and subject impact at Glasgow has been built since 1451 and recorded in our library archives and museums. So how might we integrate the information um, from our catalogues into the um, publications repository is one question that we're beginning to, to look at. The collections held by almost all of us in this room have an impact on the REF in some way beyond our own institutions, but it isn't always easy to collate and pull that information together. Um, and that's assuming that society wants us to justify what we're doing to, to, to pull all that information to, to be able to justify why we, we have archives. While we might know who's visited us to use the archives, we can capture very little of the impact as, it, as that moves forward. And they, what do they do with the knowledge that they uncover when they use their collections? 
What is very clear is that we're now moving from open collections to engaging collections. Um, Jenny Chambers, Head of Public Engagement at the Research Councils UK, has recently spoken of moving from the research dissemination phase to a research engagement phase. So what can we as heritage professionals bring to support that? Um, this is something very familiar to, with those, to those of you at the National Archives. Um, preserving archives is important, not just for the REF and to, to make information available for a very specific time. It's an important part of a de democratic society. So as an, uh, an archivist responsible for documenting the University of Glasgow's history, um, this year I've been working with my digital library colleagues to create an online archive for priority born digital materials to enhance the REF 2020 submission, should it be in 2020. We'll be creating a pilot project of self-archiving the, co the communications office, press releases and filmmaking. Um, several efficiency drivers for doing this, not least um, because they adopted this um, procedure without really thinking, they, they adopted filmmaking without really thinking about the information um, management aspects to it. Um, so we're, we're kind of coming in to, to solve a problem, but also that will give us an in to create a digital repository for that filmmaking, to permanently preserve it, to sit and support the REF. So what else are we doing in the library to integrate and streamline to present our researchers and the research to the world more efficiently and engagingly? We're investing in linked data approaches, particularly looking at the person's um, linked data, because there's such a confusing array of ways to present um, indiv an individual researcher in the online world. We are working with the Hunterian, my colleague Maria will be talking about that, um, and with Axial on KE EMU content management system to make object metadata interoperable with print archive catalogues and the repository and to maximise their own online discovery. We are also collaborating with Maria uh, and our university research office to try to develop um, key performance indicators for how we as heritage services will be supporting online research dissemination and engagement. My final slide is um, I want to talk about where I think my work is converging more with the work of Maria as a, a museum curator. Since 2006, the University Archives have led a project called the University of Glasgow Story, which gives the context to the university's history from 1451 to the present. It started as a way of managing routine repetitive inquiries, like who was the professor of chemistry in 1727, etc. It's been through several project phases and the underlying technology is clunky, but based on the funding that was available at the time. In this new era of integration, we're working for this to become a set of data that will be part of the wider library and museum systems. And we're hoping that by integrating that past and present data, we'll be able to show the, the, the data from all our researchers in a, an interesting and more dynamic way. Um, it will make it easier for the public to see how research today brings so many possibilities for humanity tomorrow. It's that often more easy to see how something from 100 years ago is, is, has impacted on us today rather than saying this is the, the breakthrough science. It's sometimes easier to tell that, that story. And so our online um, users might be inspired to be the next James Watt or Adam Smith or today's equivalent or maybe a more modest ambition would be that they would wish to visit the university and its four-star visitor attraction, which is the Hunterian Museum. So that's over to Maria. You see, we're trying to apply in practice the inter-institutional collaboration, so we're doing a bit of a double act, but it's also my own role, which was created a few years ago is at the University of Glasgow, but it's a joint one, half between the Hunterian, the museum and gallery, and the, the other half within the School of Humanities and the College of Art, the HATI, the Humanities Advanced Technology and Information Institute. And as Laura mentioned, because my role is to be a little bit, not just a split personality, but really a go-between 
trying to increase the use of the collections. It's very interesting to see today the different papers and panels, how the collaborations both within and outside the university are making us rethink, uh, among other things, um, the REF and impact on different communities and users. So university museums like the Hunterian are all rethinking the new possibilities um, to make better use of their teaching and engage in new ways um, in the groundbreaking research they're undertaking. So it's interesting to look at some of the specific ways. In Glasgow, we just moved to the Kelvin Hall project that you might have heard about, which is a very large um, capital project that brought us in partnership. Um, the University of Glasgow and the Hunterian being one of the three partners, the Moving Image Archive of the National Library of Scotland, the other one, and Glasgow Life, which has both the Glasgow Museums and the Glasgow Sport Branch being the third one. So having the town, gown, the civic, national, and academic institutions collaborating together brought its own very interesting challenges and a lot of opportunities. For example, you will notice sport is there together with the museums, which was quite a challenge for some of my curatorial colleagues. And I mentioned at the Collections Trust Conference a few weeks ago that maybe throwing the sports hall, the basketball, and the dance studio that we have next to the collections and seeing the different kind of audiences maybe in the rack would be very interesting to watch. It was the only thing that was tweeted from the rest of my talk, so it would be interesting to see actually in practice this. But apart from the sports, it's also the collections of the three partners are being brought together in the Open Collections portal, and that has created the need for more support and resources. So uh, we opened up a post to support this and we need much more in that direction. As part of that, it was also developing case studies and guidelines for assessing the REF because I think it's becoming already obvious, not just from this panel, but from some other comments in the conference and from your own experience, nobody really knows. That's why I made the Brexit, um, but I hope it's not going to be as painful <laughs> as that one, the next ref. But the truth is nobody really knows exactly which direction it will take. What we all know is that impact is here to stay and it's very important. And I think one of the things we're challenged, we're trying to figure out um, in line with a lot of other institutions is what is the best way to, to use this? Not just something we all have to do, but to also following the direction of doing impact engaging with audiences that we all feel is very important without um, stopping within the close refines of the REF only and still do that effectively. So one of the ways, for example, is for us, as Moira mentioned, this collaboration with the library and the archive to integrate more integrated portals and manage and use our assets. The Kelvin Hall, you see a chopped down version, I'm afraid, of the building. Um, it's only one third that has been developed uh, from this vast, gigantic building, and the remaining two thirds we're putting a, put to, a bit together at the moment. There's a one second shameless plug here. I'm also coordinating, as part of this collaboration, uh, the Scottish Digital uh, Network on Cultural Heritage Evaluation and Digital Resources. So as part of that, we're finishing um, our network activities after a few workshops with a symposium in Glasgow at the newly opened Kelvin Hall. And because a lot of you are working in this area of digital cultural resources and trying to evaluate who uses them and how is at the very heart of our symposium, and we just extended the call for proposals, there will be on that grid folder, if you're interested, the details. We have just enough few days if you want to submit one and join us in the conversation starting from here in Glasgow. But moving on from that, I wanted to very briefly, to not take over my time, mention um, two case studies that we have started exploring the REF impact and um, the use with the collection and the museum world. So one of the exhibitions, for example, is one of my colleagues in the College of Arts of the French Text and Image Studies, Billy Grove, Professor Lawrence Grove, has been working many years on the history of comics and graphic communication and using special collections and the rest of the collections in Glasgow and beyond. And a lot of his many years research res resulted in an exhibition that uh, closed a few months uh, ago um, at the Hunterian Art Gallery in Glasgow. And where we started collaborating and looking at the next ref again was trying to be a bit more strategic of how do we capture the impact to the visitors of the exhibition. For those of you who have started working with the REF, this is just one of the ways and the areas of impact. But trying to assess um, what the audience is actually getting out of maybe an hour or two of browsing an exhibition is quite complex. 
and trying to do something that you feel is very close to the cultural institution's heart, the academic one, but also follow some of the REF requirements, is not always very easy. And one of the important things is to start planning about this at the very earliest possible start that you can do that. So, um, Billy's wider research had a specific aim, um, and he's working a lot with building an academy about understanding comics, the whole history of it. He worked with a lot of different audiences, but as far as the cultural heritage community is concerned, the specific exhibition, it was important for him, and I'm mentioning this for other researchers, from your experience, whichever side you're sitting, or whether, like me, you have a little bit of both hats on, trying to make the researcher more clear about what are the specific aims of an exhibition. And for those of you putting exhibitions together, you would know that this is standard anyway but trying to see how the wider research ties in with a specific exhibition, the areas where the overlap was quite important. So in this case, was to raise awareness of the role of Glasgow and Scotland in the history and development of comics, but also build an understanding among visitors about their everyday cultural reference, reverence and how we, relevance and references, and how we see them in, the, in our everyday lives, but also try to break down some of the preconceptions about high and low art and try to expose existing and new audiences to this history and the importance of comics. For the evaluation in this one, we try to evaluate the reach of the exhibition, but mainly the visitor's experience, and we also wanted, of course, to see what was the impact of this. So uh, we used different methods, and it was important, we felt, to talk face-to-face, -face, having interviews with our visitors, and we only started in an experimental small way with 50 people, before and 50 people after they've been to the exhibition, which we, um, we think as a staff sample, if you want to think, use these things um, in a, if you want to do subgroup analysis afterwards, you really need a larger one. But we also use some of the comments from the visitor's book. We had an online survey where there were additional users responding to this and analyzed the social media and media coverage, but also the different exhibition events that accompanied the exhibition we try to analyze, evaluate, and look at how um, this worked out. Even merchandising and how that worked in relation to the specific exhibition was also one of the indicators. And all this worked more effectively because we're a university museum, one of our greatest resources are our students. So integrating the way Rachel was talking earlier on, for example, as part of a student work placement project for the museum studies was quite useful. And this is one of the lessons learned afterwards for me that try to explain the ref context to a graduate student it requires quite a lot of effort. And it's important to try to find the terminology and the language. So it becomes the win-win situation we kept talking about in the morning. Um, some of the findings, very quickly, because we're still analyzing some of the results, it was interesting that people, the before and after group, and that's quite problematic for those of you that have worked in evaluation work, these are really quite complex ideas, all our collections and exhibitions related to them, it's not very easy to analyze um, in this quite rigid before and after sort of split in groups, but because the REF quite clearly wants to see an indication that the specific research activity actually brought the kind of impact you are claiming it did, um, we decided for different reasons to try this out as well. So there were the people that had visited the exhibition, they were likely, for example, to think in terms, less likely in terms of stereotypes that we have. They did suggest, they did understand something about the importance of Glasgow, in the origin of some of those artifacts. They also um, challenged them, it seemed, uh, in terms of the financial value they would attribute to some of the works of art. You see a Liechtenstein we borrowed, for example, at the back, and compared to some mentioned artifacts we had in the collection, we tried to ask them to rank what kind of financial value, but also personal value, they would attribute to some of those. So there are some interesting results coming out of all of this. But it was interesting for us as well to try to use the Comic Invention Exhibition as um, also a test, kind of lab testing a little bit environment and a case study to help us think ourselves strategically when we're working with all the different departments in the university but also partners from outside, what are some of the guidelines and what are some of the ways to not just do a successful exhibition but maybe a potential successful ref impact case study and do the two, can they really work together at the same time effectively and successfully. So this is another example that Moira did a lot of work with another of my colleagues from the School of Humanities this time, Professor Tony Pollard, uh, who's a historian, he's a conflict historian, and they worked a lot uh, initially with Wellcome Trust funding 
on the Erskine story. And Erskine is one of the great hospitals just outside Glasgow um, where um, we have a very long history that we're, we're celebrating the centenary this year. Uh, it was one of the hospitals at, after First World War. A lot of the soldiers were coming back to be rehabilitated and was also because, and that's the link with the University of Glasgow, one of the reduced professors of surgery um, Professor McEwen was one of the first to work a lot on limb rehabilitation, artificial limbs, for the soldiers who were coming back from the war. We collaborated um, with not just Erskine and the hospital and the charity, but also the work that Moira and Tony did together was a lot with the volunteer and the charity that they have set up called also Erskine. Um, to try to put the exhibition together and bring different generations, but also the families of the soldiers and the people who work there. And this is one more of the examples where we're trying to look how the underlying research within the University of Glasgow can link with different communities and the impact it can have today. And also using some of the comic invention ex um, examples and experience to see how we can formulate our strategy for things like this project. So just some wider lessons to, from all of this work. Um, it's very important, I think, no matter what the political, academic, and other economic drivers are, to focus so much on the ref that um, it's, we all have to do. It's very important to not forget the importance of talking to your visitors and talking to your end users anyway, despite the fact that actually it's not necessarily uh, the most resource efficient way to do that and do a good ref impact case study. For those of you who have dealt with this, for example, the impact on policy, getting testimonials, the way the last, if you look up, Rachel mentioned, it's actually up there on the web, all the raw data, getting testimonials for well-known figures, academics and others, or artists, or getting um, people to also, um, uh, whether it's governmental bodies or other organizations, to show what kind of impact your research has had on them might be actually easier if you have ex um, developed all these links much earlier on, rather than getting the numbers required to talk just about public engagement. But nevertheless, I think it's a vital, it's a very important part of our mission in all uh, areas of cultural heritage. So I think trying to combine quantitative and qualitative methods when you do that is really very important. There's a lot of talk about the next ref. One of the things that has been floating around, for example, is that there will be an increasing number of quantitative indicators, performance indicators, downloads, numbers, hits of how people are using the digital collections. It might be the case or not. Even if it's the case, I think it's very important to not forget that you need the qualitative information there as well. You need to talk to people also and record this in some ways. And we saw in a very fascinating way with the keynote just before how they're dealing with the interviews of the survivors. But you need to think, and each institution will know its own way, its own audience, and its own means and capacity of how, what's the best way to do this. I'm just mentioning here that it's important, just flagging the fact it's important to combine this information. It's also very important, I think, as much as possible in real life to start thinking about impact, not just ref-related impact, but how to evidence and record this as early as possible. Ideally, we're talking about large funded research projects, for example, from the research project application stage, not when the exhibition is sometimes the end process of a four or five year uh, kind of long project. So try to think what you think the impact will be and what would be a good way to evidence that and record it and what are the kind of audiences. It's a very useful questions to have, I think, very early on and discuss with your other partners. It's also, I find from experience, clarifying what was the wider research project aims and clarifying what are the aims of the specific exhibition, which might be an output of the project, are not necessarily identical. So trying to also get a consensus on some of these things we think is very important. I don't have time to analyze. We're looking at the rest of the ref, the last ref's impact case studies and what's the relationship with memory institutions, whether it was exhibitions like the examples I mentioned or creating online resources or other forms of engagement. Um, it's quite challenging to draw out the data on what exactly the role of the memory institutions were played, because although it is free data, it's available, it's all up there, actually trying to make sense reading between the lines is not always easy. And it seems in some cases, although there were cultural institutions involved in several of them, it's not very clear how active a role they had. And some of this um, 
issues that Moria, Moria mentioned also role, but also other speakers about the need to more actively engage in these partnerships, I think is also coming up. For some of you who are interested in all of this and are relatively new, the public engagement website is up there because there's quite a lot of useful resources on some of the ways public engagement, the forum took, and also guidelines and some of the research projects and a lot of things you might want to look up. So to finish off, I think um, a lot of us are doing very important impact work anyway. It's not always easy to fit this in RF parameters, but it's important for us to continue to do so while at the same time being a bit more strategic, getting more informed as this is shaped up. How would this effectively and efficiently fit in maybe a potential RF impact case study? It's quite complex, the form and type of impact this can have. Some of the children, for example, are asking those 1,000 questions from the survivors, and what was the impact from listening to the interview it would be so difficult to quantify or record in a way that makes sense. But I think it's important for all of us collectively to talk and discuss maybe about the challenges that this process brings. Also, I think the vocabulary, somebody else mentioned this today, the need for us to talk the same language, whether it's for researchers to understand the impact language, or whether it's cultural heritage professionals, students, and the public understanding the REF language, but also being more transparent about this whole process for our different kind of publics and communities, I think it's also an important point. This has created a lot of new roles within Glasgow, but also in a lot of other places. Uh, public engagement people, knowledge exchange people, ref impact people, uh, recording all this. And um, in some cases, it's been added to promotion criteria, but it's still another area that's problematic, that although impact is very important, needs to be valued, it's slowly, and not always um, happened yet, it needs to also be integrated in the work we do, not just in academia, but also in the cult cultural heritage side. Um, so there's a lot of people, some of them reflected some of those new roles that we wanted to thank, not just our hosts for inviting this and the useful conversation. And I'll just finish off there. Thank you very much. <laughs>